Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening Lenten service for March 17th. Tonight we continue to consider resilience as an act of faith and hope, focusing on resilience as acting with courage. I'm Pastor Gloria Stubich. I'm the interim pastor at Bethany Lutheran Church in Boston, and we welcome you to worship with us and hope to be as gracious hosts for you as all of you have been for us. In this time when we cannot worship together as we would like to, it has been a gift to be able to visit other churches throughout the La Crosse Area Synod. And uh, for their assistance with our worship tonight, I want to offer my personal thanks to Linda Bonert and Kathleen Morose for sharing the gift of music with us tonight. As has been our practice for these midweek services, I invite you to take a deep breath, open yourself to what God is going to be saying to you tonight, to open your heart to offer the prayers that weigh heavy on you, and to take a moment to light a candle, remembering that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Gather us in, O Lord, as your people, as people who are grounded in faith, who understand resilience as a gift that is seen in expecting, knowing, trusting, acting, believing, and living. We sing together, gather us in, verses 1 and 4. Worship continues as we share together the poem, God is with us, from Suzo, Susan Paolo Sherwin's book, Meditations for Worship. Perhaps we do not remember it, as loving arms held us, and the water of new belonging splashed over us. Each Ash Wednesday, we see the sign again revealed, 
We had forgotten it on ourselves. We had neglected to see it on others. But it persists, that sign, that cross, a smudge of mortality, a nudge of remembrance, a remembrance of water poured out, a remembrance of anointing, a remembrance of a way made straight for God. You have been sealed with the cross forever, forever. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Amen. Take a moment to mark your own forehead with that cross. And if you are worshiping with others, take a moment to remind one another of the words we hear at every baptism at this font. You have been marked with the cross of Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit forever, forever. We sing together, bless now, O God, the journey. Our reading for this evening comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verses 15 through 21. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dwelt 
dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. There is much that I do not know about my family's history, but I do know enough to say with complete confidence that I am one in a very long line of resilient people. I've heard the stories, and I'm sure your family's history has similar stories. The story of my great-grandfather who left everything and everyone he knew to come to the United States and try to build a better life, a life with less poverty and more opportunity. Stories of my great aunt who trained as a nurse specializing in caring for babies born prematurely, whose knowledge saved the life of my own mother who was born far too early. Stories of generations of men changed by their experiences of war, who battled addictions and the ghosts that haunted them in order to provide for their families, of long-suffering women who endured and somehow did what had to be done for their families, stories of entrepreneurs, stories of heartbreak, Stories of success, stories of failure, stories of love in unexpected places. I draw strength from the stories of those who endured, persevered, and held on to the hope of a better day they could not yet see. You won't find the names of any of my ancestors in the history books. They weren't rulers changing the course of human history. Instead, they were those who did the best they could with what they had in the time they were given. And that certainly changed the course of my life and those who are yet to come. The biblical stories were first told as generations breaked, baked bread together or labored in the fields in the heat of the day while they scrubbed the laundry or threshed the wheat. When times were hard, you can be sure, around the fire while stretching the little they had to make a meal that fed them all, the people told stories of God's faithfulness, of God providing, of how God heard the cries of the people and heard, answered their prayers. From those who have gone before, the people found the faith they needed for the time at hand. Today's reading tells us just that kind of story. Center stage is where you find the history makers, Moses and Pharaoh. You know this story. Egypt is a world superpower, and the Hebrews are the Egyptians' slaves. Generations have passed since Joseph and his brothers, so many generations that the Pharaoh remembers him no more, which also means that he remembers the promises that were made to Joseph's people no more. The Hebrews have grown in number, enough to make Pharaoh nervous that they might join forces with one of Egypt's enemies. So, he creates policies that are intended to break the Hebrews in body and in spirit. Yet even still, their numbers continue to grow, so more drastic measures are needed. Every Hebrew boy who is born is to be killed at birth, and if they survive birth, throw them in the Nile. You know this story. Center stage is filled with God moving through Moses in all his Charlton Heston glory, leading God's people out of slavery into the promise of freedom. 
But for Moses to grow into a man, you have to pay attention to what's happening at the sides of the stage. And there you will see the action that captivates me. You will see the courageous actions of a handful of ordinary women. There is Jugbed, Moses' mother, who refuses to obey the unjust law that demands that she throw her baby boy in the river when he is born. She hides him as long as she can, and when she can hide him no longer, she crafts a basket, sealing it to make a tiny floating raft. And she places her baby boy inside. The best that she can hope for is to give him a day, maybe two, before he dies of exposure. One more day, and I like to think that she wanted to force anyone who found this makeshift raft, she wanted to force them to face the horror of the Egyptians' cruel law. Nothing reveals injustice quite like an innocent life cut short. Then there's Miriam, Moses' older sister, who follows that basket as it drifts along, hiding in the reeds along the shore of the river, watching what happens to the baby. And when Pharaoh's own, own daughter picks the baby up out of the river, it is Miriam who arranges for Moses' own mother to be his wet nurse. And of course, there is the princess herself who finds the floating baby and courageously decides to raise the Hebrew boy under the roof of her father, the one who mandated that all Hebrew boys be killed. But the exodus from slavery to freedom begins with the midwives, Shifra and Pua. These are Egyptian names, which tells us that they were not Hebrews, that they likely did not have families of their own and were therefore able to tend the lowest and the least and the most vulnerable. Their names mean splendor and beauty. And they were more than midwives as we know them. They probably oversaw a whole crew of midwives. And midwives in the sense of the ancient world, which means they were more like visiting nurse practitioners, tending the sick and the dying, as well as tending and birthing new life. They were the kind of people who tenderly hold the mystery of life and death and who know and face every day how precious life is. In commanding the midwives to kill the baby boys before their mothers could lay eyes on them, to make it appear as though the child were stillborn, Pharaoh condemns the Hebrews to a fate even worse than the genocide he is enacting. He believes in his life after death. That's what the massive building projects are all about. But the Hebrews, they believed that a person lived only as long as their sons and grandsons remembered them. And Pharaoh intended no sons for the Hebrews. Therefore, no memories. The midwives couldn't do it. Having felt the kick of the unborn ones, having turned a child in the womb, looking in the eye of a frightened young mother, 
holding the hand of an older woman who has endured the deaths of too many children, sharing the sweat and tears at the bedside. Shifra and Pua resisted together. They knew the weight and the cost of the mandate. They knew the consequences for disobeying the Pharaoh, but they also knew their calling. What Pharaoh demanded of them went against their role as healers who were about the work of birthing new life. In refusing to obey Pharaoh together, they claimed their place in the story of God birthing the people of Israel. These women not only conspire against the unjust mandate, they also conspire to speak up to the angry ruler. The Hebrew women are not like us. They have their babies so fast we can't get to them before they're back on their feet in the kitchen. Now this story was written down about 300 years after it happened, long after the people were safely delivered into the promised land. In 300 years, they had lost some of the details of the story, like the Pharaoh's name, but they remembered the midwives. They remembered the midwives who had safely delivered their people when its very existence hung by an umbilical cord. So what does this story mean for us? Why do we remember and tell this story thousands of years later? Because Shifra and Pua made God's presence tangible in their world, not just for their own people, but for the most marginalized of all people. In their lives, in their work, they were on the side of life, the fullness of life for all people, even when it put their necks on the line. They could have done what Pharaoh ordered them to do. They could have believed that they had no power to influence the leader of one of the world's great superpowers. They could have left it for someone more important to resolve. Yet they knew that they were all these women had. They were the only hope those children had. Acting, responding to God's voice was hard. And it took courage. Doing the right thing was not the easy thing. But childbirth isn't easy either. And more than anyone, these midwives knew the reward that comes from the work of labor. God was in labor to give birth to a new world, a new people, a new way of being in relationship with one another. And God needed these ordinary women in order to accomplish extraordinary things. Each and every day, we face moments in where we have to decide what we are going to do about the situation we are in. Whether we are facing the reality of racial injustice, the vulnerability of the working poor in our neighborhoods, drug abuse in our communities, lack of access to mental health care, and the number of people who are imprisoned because they can't get addiction or mental health support, or the loneliness of our elders It takes courage to see the black body killed in the street, the Syrian child on the beach, the family torn apart at the border, the persecution of the Uyghurs, the hunger of the Nigerians, the longing of the Palestinians for the right to work and own land 
and receive the COVID-19 vaccine. This is how liberation starts. God's liberating work starts with telling the truth about what is happening and then discerning together who we are and what our calling is. And then drawing on the strength of those who have gone before us to find the courage to act in response to God's call now. Without each of these women in this story and their create courageous ask, acts of resilience and resistance, Moses could not have grown up. Moses could not have been the one to lead the people. And for all those years, as Moses went from infant to man, these women may have felt that their work was in vain, but they were part of God's larger work to bring life, healing, and liberation. And whether the, the world changed by their actions was not the point. The point was their faithfulness to God's call, their willingness to fulfill who God had made them to be. This statue stays in my office here at Bethany. It depicts what happens in Exodus 15, verse 20, which takes place just after the Hebrews have crossed the sea out of slavery, to the other side. Then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dancing. When my grandmother died, that was the text I chose to preach at her funeral. And when I see this this work of art, I remember that I come from a long line of resilient people who lived imperfectly but strived to live faithfully. And in doing so, they made a way for me. And now it is up to me and to you and to all of us to set about the work of birthing new life bringing justice and dignity for all people and acting with courage to confront the forces that defy God. When I see these women dancing together, sometimes I see myself with the ancestors. Sometimes I see myself with the generations that are yet to come. Sometimes I wonder what stories will be told. But we persevere. We remain resilient, not knowing our full strength until it is tested. Until that day when we all take up our tambourines and dance the liberation of all the forces that keep us bound. May we be God's hands in birthing that new reality into being. Thanks be to God. And now we pray together using Marty Haugen's uh, prayer, Watch, O Lord which is a, a musical setting of a prayer of St. Augustine. We sing. Watch, O oh Lord, with all those awake this night. 
watch, O Lord, with all those who weep. Give your angels and saints charge over all who sleep. Tend your ailing ones. Rest your weary ones. Bless your dying ones. In your love, O Lord of all. Watch, O Lord, with all those awake this night. Watch, O Lord, with all those who weep. Give your angels and saints charge over Soothe your suffering ones. Your love, Lord. Heal afflicted ones. In your love, Lord. Shield your joyous ones. In your love, Lord, Lord of all. Watch, O Lord, with others. Watch, O Lord, with all those who weep. Give your angels and saints charge over all who sleep. Hold your grieving ones. Give your love, Lord. Raise your fallen ones. Give your love, Lord. Mend your broken ones. Guard your little ones in your love, Lord. Guide your searching ones in your love, Lord. Grant us all your peace in your love, Lord, Lord of all. Watch, O Lord, with all those awake this night. Watch, O Lord, with all those who weep. Give your angels and saints charge over all who sleep. Let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, this suffering won't last forever. Our generous God has great plans for us in Christ. Our God will strengthen within us what is needed to go forth in confidence and with resilience, to share the good news and to act for justice in the world. In the name of God, the creator, sustainer, and redeemer. Amen. And God be with you until we meet again. Thank you for joining us for worship this night. Rest well.
Yeah.